Hi, my name is Emily Shelton, and I'm a horticulturist at the Chicago Botanic Garden in the North Chicago suburb of Glencoe, Illinois. The Chicago Botanic Garden lies on 385 acres of Cook County Forest Preserve land and contains 26 individual display gardens. Each of our horticulturists here maintains a particular garden, and I'm in charge of the research and evaluation gardens, which includes our three-year-old 16,000 square foot green roof garden atop the Daniel F. and Ada L. Rice Plant Conservation Science Center. This is a really great project designed to incorporate another facet of our plant evaluation program with the aesthetic standard applied to all our display garden areas here at the garden. As we are a botanic garden, the main focus is, of course, on plants. By evaluating new plant species on common to green roof cultivation, we hope to expand the industry's tried and true plant palette, especially on shallow soils less than eight inches. Here we have the North Roof Garden, which is comprised of mostly tried and true sedums, rock garden and alpine plants like Armeria maritima, ground covers like Phlox subulata, grasses such as Calamagrostis and Sporobolus, and other native and exotic species and cultivars. Our South Roof is planted with only North American native species. This includes many prairie plants like Andropogon gerardii and purple prairie clover, some glade habitat species like Onothera macrocarpa, and other native straight species. The following slides will go a little more in depth with the design and plant selection and some details on our plant evaluation program. So our first slide here, courtesy of the Roof's designers, Omi Van Sweden, shows the design concept which integrates display garden space and evaluation space with unique design features meant to showcase some of the workhorses of green roofs, like the sedum control strips on the left side, the purple strips that you see running the length, um, and different green roof planting techniques, like the tray system on the right, the little red squares. The blue areas are intended to be display garden space. This area is reserved for some of the more common and proven green roof plants, while the red areas are intended for plants under evaluation. The tray system on the right brings forward well-performing evaluation plants into the display area. Over time, evaluation plants that have performed well will be brought forward to replace any possible losses in the display garden areas. You'll also notice the different shadings of color. This illustrates the depth of our growing media. We have swaths of four, six, and eight inches, and many of our plant species repeat in each depth, so we can evaluate performance, growth rate, et cetera, in each of the varying depths. Here you can see some of the intended plant species in the plant layout. You can see the design is very structured, especially on the north side, in part due to the sedum strips, but also because of the metal edging that defines the beds based on media depth, and by the plants that were selected based on foliage and bloom color to produce the effect of broad swaths of color, the trademark concept of the new American style of gardening that Omi Van Sweden employs. Here you can see that effect after planting. So I'd like to go back for just a moment to this slide so I can point out the delineation of evaluation space shown here in red. The blank space you see down the center is a half story higher than the planted areas and is the building's atrium roof. The sides are all glass so you can see straight through to the opposite roof. The lined area at the top of the slide is the viewing deck with railings around the perimeter. The evaluation space is allocated in the back half of the planting because, in theory, if something doesn't perform well, it won't be as visible, while the display space, which is planted with more reliable green roof species, will always look good. Now, there is a defined list of evaluation criteria looked at and recorded by Richard Hockey, our manager of the plant evaluation program. The minimal evaluation period is four years, at which time the plants are released from the program and the plan evaluation notes are published. Some of the criteria that is looked at includes cultural adaptability to the soil and environment of the green roof, winter hardiness, disease and pest resistance, and ornamental and habit traits such as plant height, bloom time, and length of bloom, and whether or not the plant holds up in drought or if it goes dormant. It's also important to mention that minimal cultural care is provided. That's not to say that it's a low maintenance roof. The majority of time spent up there is weeding, both weeds that have seeded or come in with plant material and plants that are seeding freely, like some of the penstemons, asters, and grasses. 
It's crucial to remove unwanted seedlings, especially if plants with extensive root systems like big bluestem while they're still small. Otherwise, you're disturbing too much of the plant material and soil around the plant. Besides weeding and cutting back in spring, we don't do much. We irrigate only when absolutely necessary. This past summer, now referred to as the drought of 2012, we had very little precipitation and streaks of 100 degree days. I ran the irrigation twice. We want to see how drought tolerant the plant selections are, but not risk losing the entire roof. So in conclusion, our green roof gardens here at the Chicago Botanic Garden are now entering their fourth winter season. We have high expectations for next spring. About 4,000 bulbs were added this fall to existing bulb plantings. We found that the smaller the bulb, the better the survival rate. Species tulips, jonquil type narcissus, and squill have performed well, and we've added some new iris species. So come out in the spring for a visit and see for yourself how this roof is doing. It's one of the few Chicago green roofs open to the public seven days a week. You can find more information about the green roof and the garden at chicagobotanic.org. Thank you so much for attending the Virtual Summit 2012, and please come participate in the following 15-minute Q&A. Hi, I'm Keith Tufts, lead architect for the Seaport Farmers Market in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. I'm here today to take you through a presentation of that market, and specifically the award-winning green roof on top. Please enjoy the presentation. The market's located in Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is on the eastern tip of Canada and uh, North America. Uh, you can see it here with the red dot and its proximity to Chicago, where this presentation originally took place and where the green roof on the Seaport Farmers Market originally won its award. The market itself is a hundred-year-old sea warehouse on the harbour in Halifax, Nova Scotia. It was in uh, quite a state of disrepair when we first looked at it, uh, basically an empty shell that used to move goods from the ocean to rail uh, through the building. On the roof, an EPDM roof, this is what we transformed into our award-winning green roof and public deck. And this is a design model uh, showing what we plan to do to transform it. Uh, we pulled the building back to reveal a covered market. There's four storefronts uh, on the front, like cafes, fish stores, bread shops and the like. And then four uh, tall solar lanterns which are bringing sunlight deep uh, into the building. Uh, they're also a metaphor for Nova Scotia bridging uh, both uh, the view from the street to the harbour, uh, basically connecting land and sea in a visual metaphor for Nova Scotia as well as the market which is a place where you can get produce from the land and the sea. Up on the roof, uh, the green roof itself, uh, as well as solar technologies, uh, wind technologies and one of the uh, one of the largest decks uh, in Nova Scotia. The roof itself is one of the largest green roofs in Nova Scotia and the idea was to get people up on the deck so they could experience the roof, uh, the view and the various environmental technologies. Cross section of the building shows some of those technologies. The uh, passive ventilation system starts with the blue arrows bringing in sea breezes on the right side of your image and then at the top of the solar lanterns you can see with the red and the orange arrows where the passive ventilation is released using the building basically as its own system or as a lung. Uh, the solar lantern on the front of the building is bringing in uh, lots of natural light into the building as well as uh, the exhaust uh, from the passive ventilation system. Uh, geothermal wells which are shown on the left side uh, lower on the drawing provide uh, some of the heat and up on the roof we also have uh, solar thermal which provides the rest of the heat that's all distributed for domestic hot water use within the market as well as for the heating system itself which is a radiant floor um, across the whole building one of the most efficient means of uh, providing heat in the building uh, and then finally on top of the building of course we have the green roof which uh, not only collects rainwater um, reduces the heat island effect and provides uh, habitat on the waterfront again uh, it's basically a thermal blanket in the summer and means we have no requirement for air conditioning, another great energy saver uh, in the market. These are some of the different technologies we looked at. and We actually looked at over 20 and chose 17. And we did that on the basis of uh, making sure first they were an environmental technology, but made sure that they also were making economic sense. And some of them made a great deal of economic sense. 
The model national energy code uh, shows here a sort of an energy profile for a highly efficient uh, building according to that energy code. Um, the purple is the area lights, the yellow is the space heat, the uh, pink uh, or salmon color is the ventilation fans, and domestic hot water is the dark blue. The seaport market is quite a bit more efficient than this and has the following profile. You can see a lot less energy being used for lights, heating, uh, and ventilation fans. To quantify the actual technologies we did use, we did up this chart showing you know high performance building envelope, efficient indoor lighting and the like, and some of the other technologies I'd already talked about. The net result was a, a internal rate of return of 18.6 percent. Now that's not just what you can get in the stock market, someone trying to sell you a bridge, that's actually well within your control uh, because it's savings and if you operate the building as it's designed, you will save that amount, that amount uh, in your operating costs against your investment in these green technologies. So try finding that kind of return on Wall Street. Now for example, we have uh, savings which right now you might be able to get 2 or 3 percent. Uh, the stocks, if you're lucky, the stock market might produce 7 percent for you over time, whereas the green technologies are 18.6, significantly better. The green roof itself, uh, it has uh, 10 different varieties of sedum and some alliums in a design planting. It's a Suprema system so that we had the 20-year warranty. And you can see we put waves in it to emulate the ocean uh, that it fronts on and uh, captures the different um, types of sedums and stuff to create a layering effect so that something's blooming all year long. You note on the uh, far left of that drawing that uh, there's no green roof over the roof and that's because it's actually the outside of the building. The only other thing on top that uh, is in the middle of this is the roof deck for public consumption. Because of the way we uh, design the plantings, every time the, uh, you come to the roof, something different is going on. Different things are blooming at different times. This is this profile in the spring, the summer, and the autumn. Of course, in the winter, it's covered in snow. The uh, section through the green roof, uh, it's an inverted roof, so basically we have the membrane on the bottom and then uh, R30 uh, rigid insulation, and then the buildup for the green roof itself from there would be the root barrier, um, the drainage and uh, water retention layer, the geotextile, the growing medium itself, and the vegetation. Um, we used full uh, Suprema um, products on this. Uh, they provided the best price at tender, but they also gave us a 20-year platinum warranty, and that was really important uh, to the client. We then put three plants per, uh, per square foot to uh, have the roof grow in as quickly as possible, which worked quite well. Because of the four degree slope in the roof, we were able to capture all the water at the edges through a perforated uh, metal plate that's holding back the roof uh, assembly itself. That water is then taken uh, into a cistern of 50,000 liters and used to provide all the um, uh, non-potable sources of water required in the market. Now it should be noted that 40% uh, of the roof water is held on the roof for the roof itself. During the construction of the roof, uh, first uh, you can see the membranes down and the windmills are being installed. The roof deck uh, is, uh, is, being, uh, is being constructed and you can see for the first time some of the insulation is coming up. That would be the next layer to go on. Some of the solar frames are up on top of the rooftop penthouse. And now you can see the soil which is properly distributed and not piled so that it doesn't have any structural consequences. You can see the um, uh, geotextile below some of the bags of soil and far on the bottom left uh, you can see some of the drainage tile. The plants are arriving. This is about August. Uh, the roof had three or four months growing in its first year. The allium is already in in the curve. Uh, you can see beyond the plants that are still in the trays and some plants have already been distributed. This is one of the cruise ships that pulls up. It's one of the smaller ones but you can get a sense of uh, its interaction with the roof. Uh, the green roof and uh, the sustainable technologies like the windmills. This is actually a small cruise ship, some of them are 10 stories high, and the rooftop uh, was not only designed for the benefit of the people of Halifax and the customers of the market, but also for the cruise ship customers that come as something to look down and take away and proof of how progressive a city Halifax and Halifax's seaport market is. This was a shot I managed to catch one day as the fog rolled into the summer. It seems like the building and the roof are on the edge of the, edge of the world itself. You can also see the solar technology is now in place on top of the penthouse. It's the back of the building, uh, the big sliding doors and the passive ventilation louvers are shown there, windmills above. This is the completed building. You can see the uh, solar lanterns uh, lit up uh, in, the early, in the early morning, the covered market and the harbor beyond. Close up of the harbor, that's, the, that's a vegetable and deli and a cafe 
and George's Island, which we saw in the first shot of the old market uh, in the harbor beyond. On the weekends at the market, uh, lots of people coming, upwards of 10, 15,000 people a day, and uh, you can see there's quite a bit of hustle and bustle. The market itself is uh, filled with vendors uh, plying their wares, mostly produce uh, in the spring and summer, and uh, crafts uh, in the winter. Uh, you can see it's a flourishing market, uh, lots of people, and uh, should also be noted that the roof deck you're looking at is the original roof deck, um, which we managed to preserve as part of our environmental approach to the building, it's Douglas fir. All the wood in the building was either salvaged or forest uh, certified as sustainably harvested. And you can see uh, some close-ups on some of that wood. The uh, salvaged wood was actually from Hurricane One in Halifax, which was an event that pinned a lot of people in their houses with their big uh, old residential trees that had been up for a couple hundred years. We were lucky enough to get a hold of that wood and you can see after it's been cut and put in this market, uh, it's quite beautiful. Down on the floor, some of the vendors, uh, jewelry, um, wooden pots, uh, and you can actually get a close-up there of the passive ventilation at the back of the building that's open, uh, bringing in free ocean breezes and requiring no air conditioning and no fan energy at all. This is a cheese chocolate uh, shop, a great combination. Um, there's uh, salvaged and FSC certified wood uh, for the floor above for the mezzanine. Some more of the wood and some of the detail on uh, even the exit stairs uh, in the building. And then a glimpse of two of the solar lanterns, one as entrance and uh, one as with the trees uh, next to the green bio wall, which uh, provides a rest space or a place to eat your cinnamon bun and uh, gab with your friends uh, in the market, uh, bathed in sunlight. This is the central staircase, the green wall behind, that's a bio wall. It's uh, irrigated with rooftop water. And this is essentially the green temple in the middle of the building. Uh, and it's also an attempt to bring the green roof uh, down into the room and uh, provide people an incentive to go upstairs and enjoy the green roof. The community really likes this area. They like to be able to sit and mingle and, uh, and watch, watch their community go by. Of course, a market's not simply about um, getting your groceries and getting your food. It's actually about seeing, being seen, and has a whole theatrical component to being a part of your community. Some close-ups of the green wall. And then of course the Piazza de Resistance up on the roof, what the award was all about and why we're so happy to be here. This is uh, the finished rooftop uh, deck and uh, penthouse. You can see the green roof beyond on the edge of the harbour. Uh, it's turned out quite spectacularly. People uh, love it and it's being rented quite often for events and the like. You can see some of the sedums and, and the different colours and bloom at the time of the picture. This is one of the events that took place on the market. Uh, the market basically is open for events uh, downstairs um, during the week and also upstairs and is doing weddings, parties, events, uh, quite a trade. People are quite pleased with the location on the edge of the harbour. Just a quick video to give you a sense of what it's like to be up on the market in the summer. That's the presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any more uh, interest in learning more about this, please feel free to contact me at Leiden Lynch Architects in Halifax. Thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Brendan Shea, Project Manager of Recover Green Roofs. We're up here on the Ledge Restaurant to take a look at their award-winning rooftop farm. In 2010, the Ledge Executive Chef Marco Suarez contacted Recover to design and build a rooftop farm that would allow their chefs to harvest the freshest produce available. Let's take a look at the farm. So soil was sourced just 10 miles south of the city from Reed Custom Soils. It's a roof light blended soil that we've amended annually with compost from a, a local farm. Um, we utilize UMass Amherst soil testing to determine the quantity of compost we're going to need and that's for two reasons. One, to determine what nutrients plants are going to need and also to ensure we're not overloading the roof with additional unnecessary weight. Uh, soil, be soil beds were contained with the use of a black locust uh, edge restraint. These 2 by 10s of black locusts were harvested from Western Mass um, we left a live 
edge finish. Um, the advantage of Black Locust is that it's a naturally rot resistant, uh, chemical free wood that is going to outlast any pressure treated wood without the hazardous side effects. Vegetated free zones were protected with the use of a recycled rubber mulch uh, that's non-toxic and really similar to what you see in a lot of playgrounds today. Irrigation is provided via automated drip irrigation system which um, is operated for four to nine minutes per day with an automated rainwater shutoff. The goal being to provide plants the water they need to thrive but not use really a gallon more than is necessary. And that was really one of the first learning experiences we had on this roof is how to determine the amount of water you need without creating any additional stormwater runoff, um, as well as maximizing the retention of all nutrients within soil. Despite being December, there's surprisingly a lot of activity up on this roof. Mixed greens, rosemary, broccoli, Swiss chard, all kinds of herbs are really ready for, for picking this late in the season. Uh, it's really surprising for December 20th. You know, part of the build, we had to work within the confines of the existing roof space. This was an existing building and working around mechanical equipment and penetrations in the roof was um, one of the main constraints of the project. With 4,500 square feet of roof, we were able to utilize about 2,000 square feet for planted space. We did want to allow ample access to all HVAC and mechanical equipment for other tradesmen and contractors who were going to be doing work on this roof over the next 30, 40, 50 years with the green roof uh, in place. After three full seasons in use, the roof is far more productive than when we started with less labor and material inputs. Um, we continue to work with other rooftop farmers to improve our practices and help improve the rooftop agriculture community. Um, I appreciate you all tuning in. I look forward to talking to you more throughout the virtual summit at future Green Roofs for Healthy Cities events. Please feel free to reach out to me at Recover Green Roofs and I look forward to talking to you more. Thanks a lot. So getting started, uh, we're looking at the Royal York Green Roof Design and Installation. To start with, uh, I want to take a look at what the context was, the before and existing conditions. Um, the original garden was a, a raised boxwood garden uh, built on brick planters um, that sat on, a, on two roof membranes, or two, two levels, um, a roof membrane with a gravel ballast uh, surrounding. They had extensive uh, leaks into the parking garage below and subsequently the building was forced to dismantle that garden and um, reinstall a brand new roof membrane which is where uh, we came into the project. Uh, so this is what you what the site looked like when we arrived. So the design challenges for this project were uh, considerable. Uh, just two different two different buildings that we needed to connect together. Um, the client wanted to expand access to sort of the ends of the garden. Uh, there were many multiple residents that were sort of at ground level um, with view of the roof um, and needed to have visual screening. And then most importantly, the client wanted us to make sure we maintained and protected the roof. The design that we developed um, used paving, a paving system as a means to connect the two buildings together that were on different levels as well as to extend to each end of the garden. The low door uh, thresholds um, pushed, us, pushed us towards a green, uh, extensive green roof system as the planting beds. Uh, we wanted to create also something that was visually interesting from above. Um, and we use the idea of sort of uh, water navigation routes that uh, you look at on, on the ocean uh, or in a bay um, as the means to create that construct. This is the hand sketch that we generated for the project uh, showing uh, the green roof beds in the colored areas and then along the center walkways connecting the two buildings together. 
um, the the design elements that we came up with again are uh, patterned walkways and patios uh, with recessed lighting, uh, extensive green roof beds, uh, raised planters for screening, and uh, modular and fixed furniture. Uh, this is the CAD plan um, showing the final layout of the proposed garden. So this project was a design-build project for us, uh, meaning that we not only designed it but also installed it. So I'm going to share some design lessons as well as installation lessons. Uh, so to start with, uh, it's very important that um, because we had such a strong concept for the project, uh, it really led the whole project and was helpful in solutions and in budgeting. Um, we met with the uh, building board at multiple times uh, throughout the project uh, to go over the design strategy. Um, we felt it was really important to share not only with the board but with residents um, you know what we were proposing to do um, and to share it with them visually uh, with, with plan graphics and 3D uh, imagery. Uh, we also felt that it was important to share the process of construction um, so that they could sort of get on board with what was being proposed. Uh, so what you see are the planters with sails uh, being constructed or shop. Um, be, before we had that done, we created numerous uh, models, uh, 3D models that would help residents visualize the scale of, of elements. Um, and then to help us with the installation, I think one of the big lessons was understanding site conditions and access. Uh, here are a few shots showing the access to the site. Um, and then speaking to access and understanding site conditions, um, it wasn't until the installation that we discovered uh, that the roof um, terminated at a certain point and then we had actually a concrete slab with uh, a flush grade. So here's our staff. Um, coursing around after excavating uh, that location. Um, in talking about sort of lessons learned from the installation, I thought I first would share an image of what it looked like uh, upon completion. This is a shot taken from the neighboring building. Um, and this is a close-up shot of the actual um, garden itself, um, uh, sort, of, sort of newly planted a few months in. So the list, uh, the list shown here are sort of the top uh, lessons that we felt we learned from this project. Um, starting off with uh, the idea of, of, of testing a, a roof in advance of work. Uh, on this project, uh, we had the roof tested by, by international leak detection. Um, and this was a, a really good thing to do in that we discovered uh, before we started the job that there were two breaches which um, were subsequently were, were fixed immediately uh, prior to our start uh, which was great. Um, the other major lesson we learned had to do with the paving system. Uh, our paving system was set on a diagonal uh, with offset pavers on pedestals and it wasn't until post construction that we discovered uh, that that kind of system can really has to be really secured. Um, otherwise, it can shift and rock. And so, some of the images you're seeing are of that shifting. Um, we used um, aluminum edging as one of some of the one of the restraint components, but we also added additional uh, pedestals uh, to the paving system more so than you would on a typical um, paver roof deck. The green roofs uh, for this project were planted with um, uh, extensively with plugs, um, and this was the first time that I had ever worked with uh, using plugs. And so, one of the big um, things that I learned was um, sort of the issue of understanding density. Um, and initially, uh, the spacing that I had was actually too great for what our particular client was expecting and what the end look needed to be. So in this image attached, you can see the density of the um, heuchera is quite close. Um, and this could be argued as, you know, that it, it should be further spaced, but for the program and, and for what the client was expecting, this, this was the finished look that they needed. Uh, plantings were also an issue with the uh, screening sales uh, that we developed. Um, 
we had anticipated that uh, we could accomplish sort of immediate coverage on the sales using um, uh, Clematis paniculata along with ivy. But we quickly discovered that uh, both of those vines, uh, while they are aggressive, uh, still require time. And uh, it was something that we learned um, in terms of how we could share uh, with our client um, what the proper expectations should be um, for coverage. The planters that were constructed on site uh, for the screens um, were, were made in two modules. Um, and we realized quickly that uh, the seam between the two would never be straight. Um, so one of our solutions to that ended up being uh, to clad it with a, with a cap. Um, so something useful for others to consider uh, when, when constructing something large and modular on site. We had an elaborate irrigation system um, set up for this uh, project because of the multiple levels that we were working with um, and plant types. So it's very important for anybody doing a green roof to consider what the water requirements are for the various plant types and make sure they provide enough allowance for um, um, different watering requirements. Uh, summer following installation, um, we discovered that the uh, sun reflecting off the building um, is actually quite dramatic. Um, and one area of our garden does get periodically burnt from, from this intensity. So something to always uh, think about um, in your early stages of planning um, as that as being a possible issue. For this project, we had a very extensive um, and sophisticated lighting system. Um, which ended up being very successful, but I would just recommend that anybody doing uh, something like this really work very closely early on with the lighting manufacturer uh, to come up with um, strategies and solutions early on um, so that the end result is fantastic. And in our project, we were very lucky um, that it did come out this way, but um, we could see how there could be a lot of issues that could come up um, if you didn't do proper planning. So I'd like to end by thanking you for taking the time to participate uh, and listening to um, this brief presentation on the Royal York Project. Uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, Green Roof for Healthy Cities for organizing this event and everybody um, at Town and Gardens and beyond who helped us with this wonderful project. Mm -hmm.